I'm going to talk about polarization of waves. Two kinds of waves, transverse waves and longitudinal waves. Transverse waves have crests and troughs. Longitudinal waves have compressions and rarefactions. Polarization waves only occur with transverse waves, not longitudinal waves. We'll see why in just a little bit. Typically, when we look at transverse waves, we talk about crests and troughs moving from left to right. But they don't have to move from left to right. They can move toward us or away from us. More importantly, they don't have to have wiggles that go up and down. The wiggles could kind of go up and right and down and left, or even more at an angle. The wiggles could go left and right. They're not forced to just go up and down. And that's where we want to bring in this idea of the orientation of a wave. We've always drawn waves oriented vertically, but they could be oriented in any angle. So we draw in these little arrows like this, going up and down like this, just so we can really see that this is a vertically oriented wave, a horizontally oriented wave, or any orientation. We're not limited to just 360 degrees. Waves could, transverse waves could be oriented in any angle whatsoever. So when we have light coming to us from uh, some light source, the light that comes to us from that is all sorts of waves, and each wave could be in its own particular orientation. We say that light is randomly oriented, and randomly oriented is the same thing as non-polarized light. So maybe you can tell what polarized light is. When all the rays coming at us are in the same orientation, it's polarized light. It doesn't have to be polarized vertically. It could be all oriented horizontally, and it's still polarized. So how do we get light polarized? Well, one, one way would be to use filters. And a model of what how filters work is these little picket fences or rods that are going to block the light if it's not oriented correctly. So if you look at this, these rays of light were oriented in the same direction as the filter, so those waves, um, those rays would be able to make it through. If they were oriented at other angles, then they would not make it through. So a filter is how we typically make all the orientations the same. And we could have two filters. So if this filter is oriented vertically, vertical orientations can slide right on between those things and make it through, but horizontal orientations wouldn't. They'd get absorbed. Horizontal orientations can make it through a horizontal filter, but vertical orientations don't. If I had both those filters overlapping, now we can see that Horizontal orientations wouldn't be able to make it through either of them, neither would vertical. Okay. But if I took one of those filters and rotate it so that now the two filters are aligned, now the light can get through. All right, so what the heck am I talking about? Well, these little disks here have polarizing filters, a film stretched between the disk there that does just that. So this is all the light that's coming through here, what's making it through to the camera is polarized in one orientation. If I take a second filter and put over it, it's completely dark as long as I get them just aligned perfectly. Rotate 190 degrees, light gets through. Rotate the other 90 degrees. Now they're cross-aligned and light doesn't get through. And what's happening here is, so you can see with what I'm making my model with, is these lines and the orientation of the filter. Light gets through when the two filters are aligned. You rotate 90 degrees, one of them. Now they're cross-aligned, 90 degrees to each other. No light gets through. Rotate the other, light gets through. Now, the light that I had back there was an LED light, and I have this little remote control where I could change the color just with the push of a button. So here the two filters are at 90 degrees to each other, but it's red light. Watch what happens right into here when I hit and make blue light get through there. 
you can see that we can see that light where previously we could not. Now why does it do that? Well, all the colors of light are different wavelengths. Red happens to be a longer wavelength than blue. And as the wavelength gets shorter, so does the amplitude. So blue light is really kind of small. And if blue light is vertically oriented, going up and down like that, if it's small enough, it can still get through the horizontal orientations. But red light was too big to do that. All right, so if we have these wiggles of light and it's going down and left, up and right, well, some of that wiggle is going up and down. Some of that wiggle is going left and right. And we can talk about components of the wiggle or components of the orientation of the light. And if we didn't understand that, we might have looked at this and said, hey, this one here is the only ray that could make it through. All of those other rays would um, get blocked out. But when we understand that light has components, each of these has a horizontal component and a vertical component. So I've drawn the components, I get rid of the original. The horizontal compo components would get blocked. The vertical components can make it through. So if you take all the orientations of all the waves and find components of each of those, you'll find that on average, half of the light is oriented horizontally and half is oriented vertically, 50% for each. So if this is an ideal filter, you know, it's like everything's perfect just as we designed, it's going to block half of the light. Only half the light's going to get through. And that is not what is going on with regular um, window tinting or films or stained glass. So we have to understand how regular film tinting works and how polarizing film works differently. What our experience tells us, if I just put one layer over it, it's going to darken a little bit. If I put another layer, it's going to darken it more. And the more and more and more layers I put, the darker and darker it becomes. That's because all the light that's coming at it, it doesn't block the light by blocking certain orientations, it blocks the light by just picking one ray or a, a, you know, a certain percentage of rays, regardless of what orientation it was. So the, the window tinting blocks out a certain percentage of the rays, regardless of its orientation. All right, so let's see what's going to happen when we do something similar with polarized light. So it didn't take lots and lots of layers to get all the light blocked out. It only took two polarizing filters to block out all the light. If I took a third filter and put it in front of the two layers, no more lights blocked. Behind, no more lights blocked. But sandwich it in between, now lots of light comes through. And that is 100% mind-boggling if you're not thinking about components. So if I just had two filters, one horizontal, one vertical, and I had a single ray of diagonally oriented light that has a component horizontal and a component vertical, this one can make it through. And if it makes it through and hits this filter, that filter is going to block that one. Okay, so no light made it through both filters. But if I put a third one across a line, 45 degrees to either of them, then this component can make it through and hit our middle one. It didn't hit the middle one before. But that one has components that are parallel to the filter and a component that's perpendicular to the filter. So this component had components. And that component can make it through to this one. Well, that component of components has components, horizontal and vertical, and that's the one that ultimately makes it through. And that's why two at right angles to each other, no light makes it through, but a third one, 45 degrees to either of them, now light makes it through because it broke it up into components 
along the way. Pretty wild. One of the neat things about polarized light is that light that bounces off, reflects, or glares off of some surfaces is going to end up becoming polarized. So here's a picture of a window display where, um, I don't know, maybe it looks like planets or toys or something like that, but you can hardly tell what's going on there because of the glare off of the light coming from the street and the buildings and the people across the street. So let's see how we can eliminate that glare. We have to think about skipping stones on the water. If we oriented the stone vertically and try to skip it, it might not work out so well. It might just slice into the water. But if we orient the stone horizontally, it could skip. So same thing with light. If light is oriented vertically and it hits a surface like this, it's going to just dig in like a, a stone slicing into the water. But if light is oriented horizontally and it hits the water, it's going to skip off. So if I shine all sorts of orientations of light, if I shine randomly oriented light at an angle to the surface like this, horizontal orientations or the horizontal components of the orientations are going to be skipping off that surface. So whatever light skips off the surface, like the glare here, is going to be oriented horizontally. So here's a picture of my desk or a student desk in my classroom. And in the back of the room, I have these windows and lights coming in through the windows. And you can see this glare on the book and on the table here. I can just take some normal polarized sunglasses and maybe I should make that clear, is that polarized sunglasses are the exact same thing we've been talking about with just regular polarized filters. So you can see the earpieces on these, and they either let that light come through or rotate 90 degrees and blocks it completely. Let's the light come through or blocks it completely. All right, and notice the orientation of the earpieces. So here they are there. And you can see when you wear the glasses like you normally wear them, or at least oriented the same, it blocks the glare. That's what polarized sunglasses are designed to do. Block the light that's bouncing off of water or street surfaces. It's blocking the light that's bouncing off of horizontal surfaces. So then the question is, what is the orientation of the filters in the sunglasses? So when you wear the sunglasses like this, it blocks the light. When you flip them vertically like this, it doesn't block the light. So the light that is bouncing off of here is going to skip off if it's parallel to the surface. Here the light's skipping off, so these filters must have been horizontal. Horizontally oriented light is going to skip off that surface, and here's horizontally oriented filters but the glasses were vertical. So here that light was blocked because that horizontal light skipping off that surface was blocked by the vertical filter. Okay, And fishermen love polarized sunglasses because a lot of times the light that's skipping off the water prevents you from seeing under the water to where the fish are. But this is with a polarizing filter and this is without. Lifeguards, if they work outside, are often required to wear not just sunglasses, but polarized sunglasses, so that they are not blinded by the light that's skipping off the surface. They can see under the surface and see if anybody's in trouble. With indoor pools, often lifeguards are not allowed to wear sunglasses because it seems like it doesn't look like they're paying attention, but you could still get glare off the surface. One thing, is, uh, one solution a student of mine came up with is they could put vertically oriented polarizing filters in all those windows back there so that only vertically oriented light is coming in from outside and vertically oriented light when it hits the surface is going to just dig in. There wouldn't be any glare. I, I've never seen a rec center that does this and I think it's just because it's too expensive or too difficult to manufacture such large amounts of uh, polarized film. Okay. 
Now, before I said these are vertical and horizontal, maybe I should have said they were perpendicular to the surface or parallel to the surface. That's because the surface might be oriented vertically. If the surface is oriented vertically, horizontal oriented stones are going to dig in, vertically oriented stones are going to skip off. So here's a vertically oriented surface, the lockers outside my classroom. And we can see this light is skipping off the surface. So I put the glasses in front and here it blocks it, but when I put them horizontal it doesn't block it. Rotate your head 90 degrees and it blocks that glare. Put them normally, doesn't block the glare. Here's a sheet of plexiglass and I have a red cup on a scale and then you can see the reflection of it here. Well that light is skipping off the surface. The light that's coming off of that is non-polarized. It's randomly oriented. But once it reflects off that surface, only the orientations that are parallel to that surface skip off. So watch what happens. Uh, I'm not using my sunglasses here. I'm using a large polarizing filter that's already in front of the camera, but I'm just going to rotate it. So watch what happens to the glare. It's gone. Okay. All the light that was skipping off that surface I could block with a polarizing filter. And so here's, here's the two, two different situations. Here is when it, it let the light through when the filter was vertically oriented, but it blocked it when the filter was horizontally oriented. And then notice here, see how dark the, the countertop looks here and how much light it has here? When this light came through on a vertical surface, this light did not on a horizontal surface and vice versa. That got blocked, but this glare did not. Polarizing light is really pretty cool. A lot of photographers know that you can eliminate the glare off of glass if you put a polarizing filter on your camera. And they just slap it on the front and it doesn't block the glare. What they don't or may, maybe didn't understand is that you have to rotate this thing to get it to the right orientation to block those orientations that you're having trouble with glare. Okay, now we got this really big new idea here. I talked about light being of a certain orientation. That light was bouncing down and left, up and right, or any orientation. Well, I'm going to now start talking about not just light, but the electromagnetic nature of light. And this is weird, but when light is two different waves at one time. Electromagnetic radiation, or just light, has an electric field bouncing up and down, up and down, up and down. It has an electric field doing that. At the same time, there's a magnetic field bouncing left and right, uh, sorry, right and left, right and left, right and left. And those two waves are what constitute what's called the optical wave, or just the resultant of these two. They're always going to be at right angles to each other, and one wave causes the other, and the other wave causes the one. But we'd have to study a little bit more about electricity and magnetism to understand that. Now, just like we had when we did interference of waves, you could have two waves at the same place at the same time, and then you could draw the resultant of those two waves. This was done in a plane, or just two dimensions. But when we, when we do that in three dimensions, when the electric wave is up and the magnetic wave is to the left, the resultant wave is up and left. When the electric wave is down and the magnetic wave is right, the resultant would be down and right. Okay? And it's just the timing of these two waves that create the orientation of the resultant. Okay? If I were to rotate that whole thing, so blue goes up, red goes across like that, rotate it like this, blue went up, red went across, now the wave is, the resultant wave is rotated by 90 degrees. Okay, so it's just the timing of these two things. When the blue wave is to the right, the red wave was up. So it went up and right. And then when the blue wave, when the blue wave was left and the red wave was down, the resultant went down and left. Because light has an electric field associated with it, you can use electric fields to reorient 
the light. You can twist the light in a different orientation. And that's what liquid crystal displays, LCDs, do. This example is from a seven segment LCD. Seven segments can be used to make up all the numbers. What you do is you have a mirror or a light source back here and shining light this direction here. You have a polarizing filter, one layer of liquid crystal, another layer of liquid crystal, and then a filter that's oriented 90 degrees to the other. And you can put charge on these layers. Okay, So if one is charged positive and one's negative, it will not twist or reorient the light. So light that made it through here would get blocked by this filter. If you don't put charge on them, then it does twist and reorient the light. So horizontal light came through there, it twisted it to vertical, now it can pass through and you're going to get a, a bright spot right there. That's why it's not dark. Okay, so right here this light got blocked and we get this black spot. This light had light coming through and we have a bright spot there. And you can totally change the charge on these and let light come through or not. Okay, a, a, graphing calculator has a liquid crystal display, not with seven segments, but with little pixels here. And in this picture, the screen is completely black. That's because there is a layer of liquid crystal, of polarizing film on that. And then in front of the camera, I have another one that's at 90 degrees to that. So no light can make it off that display. But if you rotate the display 90 degrees, now this one is parallel to this one, and you can see what it says. Physics works. Be sure to like and subscribe. I appreciate it. Thank you. Anyway, um, you can also do this with little pixels of color. So you could do red pixels, green pixels, and blue pixels, and you can use those colors to make up all the colors. So a television like this, uh, an LCD television, you can rotate and not let light go through, or rotate and let light go through. The projector does something just a little different. Instead of having all the pixels oriented the same way, red and blue pixels are oriented one direction, green is oriented a different direction. So with the push of the button, I can let red go through, I can let go, red go through or block it, or let it go through. Notice red is going through and blue is also going through, or I could rotate and block it. When blue goes through, green does not go through. If I rotate it, then green can go through. And then I could let all the light go through and let green go through and just pull it over there to the right, or turn it and get magenta. And then I can pull it back and bring it back into magenta and then I leave it and it's still magenta. Obviously, no questions there, I'm sure. Or you say, what the heck is going on? That's crazy. I've never seen anything like that. What I did here was I had uh, the, I, I did a little things with, with PowerPoint to just make uh, a white circle appear there. And then later on, I just made that white circle turn magenta. But here's what's going on. White is not really white. White is the mixture of red, blue, and green. So red, blue, and green are shining right there. And I can let green go through and block the red and blue. That's what's happening here. When I rotate that 90 degrees, I'm blocking the green and letting the red and blue come through. But red and blue together make this color called magenta. And this is just the slide that I used to do that. So I had a little circle there so I could line up that. It turned green, moved it over here, and then when I brought it back after letting the red and blue go through, I turned that to magenta so that when I pulled it away, it was still magenta. So just a little trickery there. So if I hold these sunglasses, these polarizing sunglasses in front of it, so I'm looking at the shadow on the screen of the projector, when the glasses are oriented this direction, it's green, magenta like that. What is the orientation? Remember, glasses have filters that are, that are vertical when you're holding it typically. Vertical oriented light blocked the green, so 
the green must have been horizontally oriented. When I flip them up like this, green goes through. Okay. And if you're wearing polarized sunglasses and in, in any situation where you're driving, the manufacturers make sure that if you have a liquid crystal display speedometer and you're wearing your sunglasses, they want to make sure that you can see your LCD speedometer. So they're very careful about the orientation of the light that comes off there not to get blocked by your sunglasses. But if you're not driving, like getting out of your car and going to pump some gas, uh, there's a liquid crystal display. If you get out of your car and that screen is just black, well, it's because you have polarizing sunglasses on and you can, it's not really a broken machine. Okay, and whoever made this television set was careful to think, hey, maybe someone's going to um, watch television with polarized sunglasses, so I have to um, orient it so it works. One clarification is that LCD televisions, all three colors, red, blue, and green, are oriented the same, but liquid crystal projectors, um, just the way the light comes through there and have to, how they have to separate it and stuff, um, red and blue is one orientation, green is another. Okay, if I rotate the glasses vertically, light gets blocked. If that whole television set was oriented in um, portrait mode here, then it would get blocked. And I discovered this driving into Glacier National Park. I was driving with my polarized sunglasses. We drove through there and my wife noticed that all the uh, campgrounds were, were, were full. I think, how'd you see that? I didn't see anything. Well, she wasn't wearing sunglasses, polarized sunglasses, and I was. That's what I saw. So we had to turn around, go through a line again, and I had to get this video of putting my glasses over the camera, pull it off. Oh, now we can see what's going on. There is a really neat thing you can do with LCD monitors. Remember that if you send horizontal light through and you have the charge on those pixels right on the LCDs, it could either twist the light or not twist the light. If the light didn't get twisted, it gets blocked. If it does get twisted, it gets let out. If you remove that last filter, then all the colors of light are going to get let out. And that's why the whole screen looks white here is because I very carefully peeled off that last polarizing layer from the LCD screen. If you put that layer in glasses like this in the same orientation as it was, then only the light that got twisted, only the light that was supposed to make it out, would make it into your eyes. And you can do this. And I think that is pretty cool. Up. All right, now we're going to really take it to the next level here with talking about how light changes speed when it goes into different materials. But some materials are made up in layers. And as a electromagnetic light a radiation goes between there, this red orientation can slide in between the layers and not interact as much as the horizontally oriented light crossing against these layers. So the more it interacts, the slower it's going to go. The less it interacts, the faster it's going to go. So the red wave is traveling through here faster because it's sliding in between the layers of the material. The blue wave was traveling slower because it was crossing against the layers. And where the orientation that travels the fastest is called the fast axis. If the layers are horizontal like this, now the blue wave would travel fast and the red wave would travel slow. And the fast axis would be horizontal. Okay, bear with me because this is kind of cool stuff. If this is a plastic or something that had a fast axis and light is coming in like this and it enters right here, we'll zoom in on that. When it entered here, the, the red and the blue waves are aligned, but after even just half of a cycle, you can see the red wave got a little ahead of the blue wave. The fast axis was vertically oriented. Okay? And as it continues marching along, the further and further it goes along, the further behind the blue wave would get, or the further the head, ahead the red wave would get. If the length of this is correct, then it will have slowed down the blue wave by half of a wavelength by the time it emerges. And it's called a half wave retarder. Okay, 
And what happens is the timing of the red and blue waves made the orientation like this. After it got, after it exited this material and the blue wave was half of a wavelength behind the red, now the timing is like this, so the orientation is like this. It went from this orientation to that orientation. The wave twisted and rotated by 90 degrees. Okay, and that's only if um, the length of it was correct. If it was twice as long, then it would have offset it by two halves or a whole wavelength, and it would have just put things back in line. It would have come in like this and exited like that. So if I have two polarizing filters at right angles to each other, light goes through one but not the other. If I had a material here that had a fast axis and the thickness of that material offset the two waves by half a wavelength, the resultant wave would have rotated by 90 degrees and that light would have gotten out. Now let's think about that a little more carefully. One's going faster than the other, so if there's a race like this and this person's going faster than the other, if it's a short race, this guy's just going to get a little ahead of the other. But maybe that distance was the right length of race to be half of a wavelength for blue light. Well, then blue light would get twisted by 90 degrees and exit out the second filter. Okay. If the race was longer, meaning it went through more of that material before it exited out on the other end, well, this guy's going to end up further ahead of this person. So the one wave would exit ahead of the other one, and maybe that was half a wavelength for red light. Then that would have had red light twist by 90 degrees and exit out the filters. So if I had this thin, thin layer of stuff like plastic, if it went straight through, it's going through just a short little distance of that, and maybe that was the right distance to block, i uh, sorry, to rotate blue light. If that was rotated like this and the red light hit that and went through a much greater distance like that, if that distance was correct for rotating red light, then red light makes it out the second filter. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Two filters at 90 degrees to each other. Plastic packing tape, two inch packing tape, has a fast axis. So it lets light go through there, but when I put it through there, look at that beautiful magenta. Rotate, now we're seeing more cyans. Kind of cool. So it just went through the this, this thinnest part of that, but when I rotate, it's going through greater distance. One last thing. If you put stress on a piece of plastic, it can create a fast axis. So this is just a piece of acrylic and I can squeeze that. Watch what happens when I squeeze it. See all those colors that show up? Well, it's creating a fast axis that rotates the light that came through that first filter and now makes it through the second filter. And the more stress there is, the more it's gonna twist that light. So we get these really neat colors right here. But if that piece of acrylic is going to break, it's going to break where there's a lot of stress. And it broke on me once, and it broke right where there's a lot of color. Anyway, that's a little bit about polarization of light, polarized sunglasses, and some of the neat things with liquid crystal displays, and fast axis, um, and stress with materials. Hope you enjoyed.